Alrighty, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Uh, this is uh, for educational purposes. And uh, we look at, on this channel, we look at uh, great theories of everything, all-encompassing theories, um, paradigm shifters, anything that you probably don't know about that uh, would help you with your awakening to 5D consciousness. Today is the 493rd video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. And um, Mr. Larson was an American engineer back in the 20th century. Uh, around 1959, he proposed his two fundamental postulates about how he believed the universe operated and then he elaborated his postulates through a process of deduction. If this, then that. And uh, arrived at a theoretical universe. A universe that uh, described what, you know, what his universe would look like if his postulates were correct. And then he compared his theoretical universe with the observed universe of the legacy scientists. And uh, in books like uh, Basic Properties of Matter, which is the book that we're looking at today, he uh, makes these comparisons. Uh, Larson arrives at various equations for the basic properties of matter. And then he compares them with the scientific tables that have already been published. Uh, you know, I think it's somewhat telling that Larson is able to, uh, in many cases, almost recreate the scientific tables just from theory. And uh, I think that should wake people up enough to recognize that Mr. Larson... Uh, Maybe it isn't completely right about everything, but that uh, something is on the right track with his theories. And today we are about to start chapter 15 of this book called Electrical Storage. Now, if you want to get the ins and outs of the reciprocal system, uh, you want to check out any of my first 474 videos on the subject where I go at least in a small amount of depth into how the reciprocal system works and what it can be, how it can be used and, you know, the basic uh, principles that you probably uh, need to know to be able to follow along fairly closely with this book. But for the purposes of th this video and subsequent videos, I'm pretty much just going to assume that you have some type of working knowledge of the reciprocal system. I'll stop along the way and try to explain certain things. Um, but also, you must recognize that the reciprocal system is pretty difficult. And I don't have all the answers myself. Larson didn't even have all the answers himself. And, um, you know, it's a work in progress. Unfortunately, Mr. Larson died back in 1990. And uh, there are a uh, few people alive who, um, you know, uh, who are still, you know, working on this and still writing, still um, researching. And, uh, you know, it needs to be brought back to life because it is a, uh, you know, it is a generalized theory. It's a theory that you can apply to every subject and uh, has great potential, but there is a learning curve that's pretty steep. And so, you know, we need to kind of lower the uh, gradient of that, of that learning curve and uh, encourage other people to get along, uh, get, get into it and, you know, do some things uh, as far as pedagog pedagogy is concerned uh, to, to make it uh, easier to learn. So that's why we're uh, covering this in such detail. 
Okay, we're going to start here with chapter 15, Electrical Storage. Uh, we now turn to a consideration of the storage of uncharged electrons, or what is known as electric current, a subject that was not considered earlier because it was more convenient to wait until after the nature of the electric charges was clarified. Now, just keep in mind, recall from uh, earlier chapters that uh, in Larson's system, the electron is uh, uncharged in its natural uh, state. There is a charged electron and an uncharged electron. The uncharged electron is electric current. The charged electron is static electricity. And the charge on the electron is the same as the charge that is, uh, can be applied to other particles. And like everything in Larson's system, everything is motion. Everything is a motion. And the electric charge is a rotational vibration. Uh, kind of like this. And while the electric current or the electron is a rotation. The electron is a rotating unit of space. Okay, the basic requirement for storage is a suitable container. Any conductor is, to some extent, a container. Let us consider an isolated conductor of unit cross-section, a wire. This conductor has a length of n units, meaning that it extends through n units of extension space, the space represented in the reference system. Each of these units of the reference system is a location in which a unit of actual space, that is, the spatial component of a motion, may exist. In the absence of an externally applied electric voltage, the wire contains a certain concentration of uncharged electrons, or actual units of space, the magnitude of which depends on the composition of the material of the conductor, as explained in chapter 11. If this wire is connected to a source of current, and a very small voltage is applied, more uncharged electrons flow into the wire until all of the units of the spatial reference system that constitute the length of the wire are occupied. Unless the voltage is increased, the inward flow ceases at this point. When the wire is fully occupied, the aggregate of electrons could be compared to an aggregate of atoms of matter in one of the condensed states. In these states, all of the units of extension space within the limits of the aggregate are occupied, and no further spatial capacity is available. But if a pressure is applied, either an internal pressure, as defined in Chapter 4, or an external pressure, the interatomic motions are extended into time and the addition of the spatial equivalent of this time allows more atoms to be introduced into the same section of the extension space represented in the reference system. Increasing the density of the matter, the number of mass units per unit of volume of extension space, beyond the normal equilibrium value. This ability of physical phenomena to extend into time when further extension into space is prevented is a general property of the universe that results from the reciprocal relation between space and time. The scope of its application is limited, however, to those situations in which a spatial response to an applied force is not possible. In the example just discussed, the compression of solid matter, the obstacle to further inward movement, 
in space is the discrete unit limitation on subdivision. In a wide variety of astronomical phenomena that will be considered in Volume 3, the obstacle is the limit on one-dimensional spatial speed. Here, in the electrical storage process, the obstacle is the fixed relation between the unit of actual space and the unit of extension space. An n-unit section of the extension space represented in the reference system can contain n units of actual space and no more. If a voltage is applied to force additional electrons into the fully occupied section of the wire, the excess electrons are pushed out into time where they occupy positions in the spatial equivalent of that time. This penetration into time can only be accomplished by application of a force, as the concentration of uncharged electrons in time is already at an equilibrium level. If the voltage is reduced or eliminated, the restoring force tending to bring the electron concentration back into equilibrium reverses the flow, and the excess electrons move back out of the wire. Application of a positive voltage similarly withdraws electrons from the wire and from equivalent space. As we have seen in the preceding pages of this and the earlier volume, the region of time beyond the unit of space is two-dimensional. The concentration of excess electrons and the effective voltage therefore decreases in direct proportion to the distance from the wire at a rate determined by the basic physical factors and the dimensions of the wire or the conductor reaching the zero level at a specific dis uh, distance. Let us consider a case in which a conductor is subject subjected to a voltage differential of 2V and the voltage in equivalent space surrounding each terminal reaches zero at a distance from the termina terminal. As long as the terminals, the electrodes, are separated by a distance greater than 2s, the electron storage, the quantity of current that can be withdrawn at the positive asterisk terminal and introduced at the negative asterisk terminal is independent of the location of those terminals. Uh, just remember those asterisks basically mean that uh, these are um, positive and negative um, according to the conventional usage of the term but they would actually be the reverse of that if um, kind of Larson had his druthers, but he can't really call these things negative and positive when the conventional usage is positive and negative. So instead he uses the asterisk. However, if the separation is reduced to less than 2s, a portion of the volume of equivalent space from which the electrons are being withdrawn coincides with the volume of equivalent space into which electrons are being introduced. The excess and deficiency of electrons in this common volume cancel each other, decreasing the net excess or deficiency at the terminals and thereby reducing the voltage. This means that where the separation of the terminals is reduced below 2s, the same amount of storage that will take place at a lower voltage or alternatively a greater amount of storage will be possible at the same voltage. The relations involved in the storage of current or uncharged electrons are illustrated uh, in the figure, figure 21, which I do not have access to here. When the terminals are separated by the distance 2s, the full volta voltage drop, V, takes place at each terminal. 
the electron excess at the negative terminal, which we will call E, is proportional to V. If the separation between the terminals is decreased to 2xs, there is an overlap of the equivalent volumes to which the excess and deficiency of electrons are distributed, as indicated above. The effective voltage then drops to xv. At this point, the electron concentration corresponding to xv is in the equivalent volume at the negative asterisk terminal. While the balance of the total electron input represented by E is in the common equivalent volume where the net concentration of excess electrons is zero. If the voltage is reduced, the electrons from the common equivalent volume and from the volume released to the negative asterisk terminal only flow out of the system in the same proportions in which they entered. Thus, the storage capacity at a separation 2xs and voltage xv is the same as that at a separation 2s and voltage v. Generalizing this result, we may say that the storage capacity at a given voltage of a combination of positive and negative electrodes in close proximity is inversely proportional to the distance between them. Okay, now if you are feeling lost, join the club. Uh, but, uh, you know, Larson is writing, unfortunately, for a scientifically uh, advanced audience. And so if some of the algebra and just the, the terminology kind of gets you uh, confused. Um, my only recommendation is just to go over the material again and again and again, slower and slower and slower, uh, one sentence at a time until you kind of figure out what he's talking about. I need to do the same thing with this chapter. Uh, Larson's stuff on electricity in particular is a conundrum to me. Um, I uh, feel like that is kind of my weakest area of understanding in terms of the reciprocal system. Um, and I honestly think that it's also Larson's weakest area of understanding. And so that doesn't help. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perrette has come along um, and he has um, revised much of Larson's work, especially having to do with electricity. And um, so that... Uh, confounds the matter even more, uh, but it's useful to learn Larson's system, um, I guess, before you learn Perret's system, uh, just to see, you know, the historical evolution here. Uh, we will be looking at some of the uh, work that Perret's done as well. We already have, but we will we'll be looking at some more. Um, but, you know, that's the nature of the reciprocal system, is that you... Um, you know, it's not going to be on the red carpet for you. Um, you. You have to do some digging, you have to do some uh, hard thinking, and you have to go over it um, multiple times. You might have to um, read a sentence over again 20 times before you understand what it says. Um, hopefully, uh, in the future, you know, the... Uh, pedagogical situation will improve to the point that, uh, you know, there's a textbook or something that uh, has everything, you know, right in front of you, and it makes it easy. But, uh, you know, that's kind of not the nature of uh, revolutionary new theories. Mr. Larson had to come up with an entirely new language and new concepts to express, and they're just not in general usage. And so they conflict with, you know, the way that uh, most people approach these subjects. And um, that's just the way it is. So let's keep going. The, uh, uh, the, uh, I would just say that, you know, it's worth it. You know, the, the uh, journey that I've been on in the reciprocal system has been long and frustrating. But with each, um, 
you know, confusion, um, most of the time it eventually clears up and it is very rewarding when you do actually kind of solve one of the problems that you were um, beset with originally. Okay, uh, and it's also very rewarding that you can also apply this knowledge to other subjects, every other subject, and that this is a generalized theory and that, you know, everything fits together. You know, you don't have a separate theory for electricity that you have for astronomy, that you have for economics, that you have for religion. They're all the same theory. Okay. The ability of, the, of a conducting wire to accept additional electrons when subjected to a voltage makes it available as a container in which uncharged electrons, units of electric current, can be stored and withdrawn as desired. Such storage has some uses in electrical practice, but it is, conven it is inconvenient for general use. More efficient storage is made possible by a device that contains the necessary components in a more compact form. In this device, a capacitor, two plates, each with an area of s to the second power, are separated by a distance s prime. Each plate is equivalent to s squared conductors of a unit cross-section. Thus, the storage capacity of a capacitor at a given voltage is directly proportional to the plate area and inversely proportional to the distance between the plates. This storage capacity is called the capacitance, symbol C. Since it has the dimensions of space, uh, s squared over s prime equals s, it can be calculated directly from the geometrical dimensions of the capacitor. The centimeter has been used as a unit, although the present practice is to use a special unit, the farad. Now, this has been really a problem in the reciprocal system um, one, of, one of Dr. Bruce, Bruce Peretz's associates, Dave, uh, 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 derived a different value for the farad, or farad, um, which was s to the third power over t, uh, whereas Larson is using the units just s. Um, I believe these Larson's units s work in some applications, but they kind of fall apart in certain other applications and the the term s to the third power over t seems to work better now i don't quite remember the derivation that dave used to ended up end up with the s to the third over t you know larson here is using um you know the area of the plate over the area between the plates, or over the distance between the plates. Uh, I think it's possible that Larson is dividing these things where he should be multiplying them and then putting them over a time factor. Um, but uh, just keep that in mind that Larson um, is using this uh, farad as um, units S but um, keep in mind that there is an alternate version where the farad is uh, units s to the third over t. And also that Larson claims that really no units should be um, where the uh, term in the numerator is of a higher exponent than the term in the denominator. Uh, in some places, Larson claims that that um, defies the discrete unit postulate, which I don't understand either. So this whole um, 
business here with this electrical storage is uh, one of the areas of the biggest mystery here in the reciprocal system, or you know, not the only, but one of the uh, most difficult uh, to teach and difficult to understand areas because there is a lot of contention and a lot of, uh, frankly, inconsistency. Um, but, you know, uh, it will feel great uh, when the issues are eventually resolved and um, we can move forward in a kind of a more coherent manner. Right now, there's, you know, there's more conflict. Um, and perhaps other people have worked this out, um, you know, to their satisfaction by now. But for me, I'm not, um, I'm not completely getting um, Larson's theory on electricity. If a capacitor is connected to a current supply, the effective voltage, a force, T over S squared, pushes the uncharged electrons that constitute the current into the capacitor until the concentration corresponding to that voltage is reached. The space-time dimensions of the product are T over S squared times S equals T over S. This is inverse speed or energy. Now, what would you get if you plugged in S to the third over T instead of just S? Well, S to the third over T, then you would get um, just S. And that is electric current. And that is just space. So Larson is deriving this as space or energy. But um, the RS2 version is deriving this as electric current for um, the combination here of um, uh, the voltage. Um, and the in the capacitor. <laughs> it is not a charge. Okay, this is inverse speed or energy, T over S. It is not a charge on the basis of the definition of charge given in this work, um, which maybe should have been a hint to Larson that he's kind of starting to do contortions here. It is not a charge on the basis of the definition of charge given in this work, but since electric charge has the dimensions of energy, T over S, the quantity stored is equivalent to charge. And I think Larson has said over and over again that the capacitance is all about uncharged electrons. So we'll continue. The, to minimize the deviations from currently accepted terminology, we will call it a capacitor charge, which strikes me as a contradiction in terms. The magnitude of the storage can be expressed by the equation Q equals CV, where Q is the capacitor charge, C is the capacitance, and V is the voltage differential across the plates uh, across the plates of the capacitor. So in RS2, this Q would be uh, units of space, whereas in Larson's system, this Q is units of time over space or energy or charge. Um, the unit of capacitance, the farad, is defined as one coulomb per volt. The volt is one joule per coulomb. These are units of the SI system, which will be used in most of the subsequent discussion of electricity and magnetism, rather than the CGS system of measurement that is in general use in these volumes. The reason being that a substantial amount of clarification of the physical relations in these areas has been accomplished in very recent years. And most of the current literature relating these subjects utilizes the SI system. Unfortunately, 
This recent clarification of the electrical and magnetic situation has not extended to some of the most fundamental issues, including the many problems introduced into electrical theory by the failure to recognize the existence of uncharged electrons and the consequent lack of distinction between electric quantity and electric charge. As we saw in Chapter 9, the unit of electric quantity is a unit of space, or S. We find that the unit of electric charge is a unit of energy, or T over S. In current practice, both of these quantities are expressed in the same measurement unit, ESU, in the CGS system, or Coulombs, in the SI system. Now that the electric charge has been introduced into our subject matter, we will have to make the distinction that current theory does not recognize. Um, and I think he's talking about current as of now, as opposed to current as of electron, electric current. Okay, the distinction that current theory does not recognize as instead of dealing only with Coulombs, we will have to specify Coulomb's S or Coulomb's T over S. Uh, Larson is doing um, contortions right here. He's torturing his theory to fit it within his erroneous uh, uh, assignment of units. Uh, that's certainly what it looks like to me, um, where he's having to specify between one Coulomb and another. And one of them is the units of S and the other one is S over T, or T over S, meaning that one of them is charged, one of them is uncharged. In this work, the symbol Q, which is currently being used for both quantities, will refer only to electric charge or capacitor charge measured in Coulomb's T over S, electric quantity measured in Coulomb's S will be represented by the symbol lowercase q. Um, yeah, so this just shows that, I mean, to me, I could be wrong, uh, but, you know, just looking back, from 30 years ago that he wrote this in 1987, 30, 37 years ago, that, um, you know, Larson uh, wasn't really always able to recognize when he's making an error. And um, his, his um, but, and he recognized that. He, he did say that, you know, um, my theory is 